from Paris, and I want to tell you about my first experience with Meher Baba. At that time, we never mentioned the word avatar. It was in 1931, I was just returning from a trip from Paris, visiting museums and things, when Princess Machiavelli, whom I knew a great deal, um, to telephoned one day. I had returned to America for the first reason that my mother was extremely ill. I was very greatly attached to my mother. And she, unfortunately, when I arrived, was told that she probably couldn't live very long. And I was sitting in her bedroom when Princess Machiavelli telephoned. And I heard this tremendous weeping. I suppose some of you know who Norina Machiavelli was. But she had created, she had created the role of the Madonna in, in Europe. And she had a rather famous career. And she played with Lady Diana Manners in The Miracle. Um, this, of course, brought her in contact with many personalities through Europe, through America, but it didn't give her the satisfied, uh, what shall I say, uh, inner feeling that she was always seeking. So that day, when she spoke to me on the telephone, I heard as if something had been released in her, which was a mingle of joy at the same time of tremendous sorrow. And I was terribly impressed with this idea of meeting what she said would be a master. Having been brought up a Catholic, I didn't know what the word master meant. I had never, I never had any contact with India. My mother was very religious minded. She had brought me up in a very strict Catholic way. So then, to my astonishment, when she heard the name Ameha Baba, I heard her say, Oh, Anita, I must meet him too. I said, but you, you mother, I bet you can't get up. She said, I will go to see him now if he receives me. An interview had been made for November 11, 1931. I remember it was the 11th of November because it was Armistice Day. And for me, somehow, the 11th of November will, still remains one of the great joys because it was connected with Baba. Remember taking the train, going up to Harmon. And nowadays, we're not surprised when you see people not dressed with long hair, uh, sandals. And I, being very relig being a little bit, let's say, conventional, I was a bit frightened by people with long hair, people with sandals, people that looked like, didn't look like everyone else. I must tell you that I was rather young at the time, so with age, people change. Then, going there, they invited me to lunch. I sat on this long table. They were mostly vegetarians. I wasn't used to vegetarian food. I didn't know any vegetarian people. All that gave me a tremendous confusion and fear. It was very frightful because these people seemed to be so odd. They didn't look very normal. And then this man came down and said to me, do you want to meet the master? And I said, yes, I want to meet the master. And he said, well, now it's time for you to come up. So I walked up this, seemed to me, a very long and dark corridor and stairs. And going up these stairs, my heart was pounding at a tremendous rate. And I said, well, after all, what should I do? She can't. Why not be just natural? Why not just be myself? I have been brought up. If you meet someone who is supposed to be holy, well, you kneel and you bow and you say a prayer and that will probably carry me through. So in I walked and the door opened. To this day, I can't tell you what time it was, but all I can say to you, it was as if it was the most extraordinary sun that I encountered. There sat Baba, and to my amazement, he was no stranger. He was someone as if I've always known. I ran to him like a child, and there 
I was absolutely amazed by the inner beauty that I felt, the inner joy, the inner confidence, the inner quality of human life. Everything seemed to be the thing that existed, that it was, and there I knew all about it. And he took me in his arms and said to me, do you know me? And I said, of course I do. And I laughed like as if it's the first time I'd really laughed in my life. He said, who, who am I? I said, but you are the source of all, of all goodness. And something in me was rather shy. I said, this is absurd. How can I speak of things like this? The strange whom I don't know. There seemed to be two ideas in me. One of the one, one was the man I knew and the other was my upbringing that made me conscious that I thought that he might be a stranger. But all that was swept away by this tremendous joy that I felt. As if suddenly the sun was extremely warm and everything seemed to be good in the world. So then Baba asked me, uh, what do you, he said, you paint, because he knew I was studying, going to study art. And I said, yes, I wanted to be an artist. He said, well, then you're going to paint my paint picture. And I was frightened about painting a picture. I didn't know, but something in me accepted this. I knew it, it, I had to do it. I had to face it. And he said, you're going to come next week. You're coming next week and you will um, paint my painting. You'll make, you'll make a painting of me. Then Baba asked about my mother and I said, you know, she's very ill and wants to see you. He said, I know all about her and I want to see her. He said, tell her, if she can't come to me, I'll come to see you. So you can imagine how happy I was when I walked out of that room. I was just walking on air and joy and lightness. And I wanted to write poetry. I wanted to recite to the whole world that there was nothing anymore to worry about, that everything was being turned into goodness. But then I got to my mother's home and I said to her, Baba will see you. If, if you can't go to him, he will come to you. And my mother was transported by a great, it seemed as if all of a sudden a knowledge seemed to come out of her. She said, but I know who he is. And I thought her being very ill, it was probably due to the medicines that were given to her. But I took her uh, at her word. But then I went out to Baba with my painting outfit and there Baba sat and it was an extraordinary experience because we're just the Easterns and I sat there with Baba trying my best to draw him and after an hour of sitting with Baba looked at me continually for over an hour I noticed something very strange and I said you know Baba I can't paint you I could only make something rather silly he said why I said, because you're ever-changing. Because what was very extraordinary was the eyes would go back and could come forward, they'd be light. It was something so living. The color of the skin used to change continually. It was impossible to draw someone who was so alive. And Baba says, that's right. I'm ever-changing. I can't be painted. So then I can't recall all the other stories. I can't recall all those what was happening at the moment, except that my feeling was, and as a Baba, that the silence of Baba was never to me something silent. If he was ever talking, I just had to be silent myself to hear what he had to tell me. And I became so sensitive to him that no matter where I'd be, I knew when he wanted me to be there when I would come. And I would sit there quietly at his feet. Can I stop a minute? And I was, used to sit at his feet. And then became that extraordinary month in New York where Baba went everywhere. We used to go riding. He went around many places. Um, one never knew, I never knew what he was really, what it was all about. But somehow you feel you were participating in something that was beyond your comprehension. And I've been very childish, thought, oh, what does it matter? It's his whims. Well, if it gives him pleasure, why not? It made me, it was terribly amusing. It was so alive. You didn't meet people with that kind of outlook upon life. 
So we used then we used to go to the cinema, to the cinema. And one night I remember we went to another cinema late at night because he walked around 42nd Street. He stayed at different places. We went through the subway. We used to uh, go here and go there. We used to look as if it was a tremendous. I thought it was a tremendous confusion, but it wasn't that at all. It was his way of working. And then in the cinema, I remember one sitting, I used to sit next to him, he said, what's the use of taking you to the cinema? You do nothing but sleep. Because I used to be so tired by the two o'clock in the morning that I thought, well, the only thing it was, was to quietly fall asleep, which Baba um, was greatly amused. Then to go back to my mother, Baba came to see my mother. And that was a very moving experience. One never thinks that one's parents can have sorrow. When one is young, one feels that parents are really, they do what they like, they, they have everything they want to do. What is it? They only are there to kind of make our life miserable or to tell us what not to do. And we all experience a kind of um, uh, an inner feeling of, um, uh, how can I say, of fury sometimes towards them. And it's only lately I realized that parents also have their sorrow, their difficulties, so that when Baba came to see her, I was greatly annoyed at the way she cried, because she, it seemed a cry that she never showed anyone. It was something so hidden, and I was so amazed at the same time, I thought, well, why should she cry like that? I always thought my mother was a very happy woman, a very courageous woman. Uh, she was very much, very religious. Why should she cry like this? And Baba said to her, let her cry. Don't stop her. I know what she's going through. He said to her, birds that have been caged, do not, birds that are free, do not realize their freedom like birds that have been caged. And I tell you, you will be free soon. And actually, I took that freedom as an idea that she would probably um, get well. I didn't realize that freedom, in a way, was death. But what was interesting was during this period of her illness, this illness, instead of being a, a terrible sorrow or a terrible, um, um, what I say, struggle against death, was really the most marvelous preparation for death. She became very clairvoyant during this illness. Her doctor was very attached to her. He loved her. She used to speak of Baba in ways that surprised me and say to me, now I can die because I... You'll be living in Baba's heart, and it's something so wonderful to be in. And this illness, as I say, only prepared her for a wonderful death so that a few days before she died, she called me in into her room and said to me, you know, I'm going to die. I said, oh, mommy, you can't die. How terrible. She said, but you mustn't cry. Death is as natural as living. She said, you see, when you're old, if you cut a tree that's old, it doesn't feel anything. It's only when a tree is young that feels a kind of a pain. But I tell you, I'm going to make this death as easily and as possible that you have absolutely nothing to worry about. And it was very strange because she used to pray a great deal and her Catholicism became something very large and very open. There was no antagonism between her, the church, Baba, and what she felt, what she knew. It seemed to be all one in her so that when she died, there was the most perfect serenity. When she began to die, I was watching her, and very quietly, she said, you know, I shall be able to close my eyes myself. And she really died in the most beautiful, peaceful way, as if it was just a great sleep. So you can imagine what it was like for someone to have been told that death is something natural, and absolutely not to experience any fear. And then we wrote, to, I sent, we sent a cable to Baba. Norina Machabelli was in Florence, and Baba had tele, sent a, a cable back saying, 
now Anita will come to Europe when you're all coming to Europe. And then begins this extraordinary life with Baba. I began to go to art school, I began to study, and then we came to Europe in 1933. Baba was, we met Baba in Geneva. I never took part in these great uh, plans of Baba because naturally the older generation that had a lot to do with him. It seemed to me my role used to be always to sit at his feet and be gay and be happy and to feel like taking care of him. I used to, he used to give me his socks to wash and I said, oh Baba, people can do it so much better than I could. Why don't they do it? He says, you, you just wash my socks, they'll be all right. And I used to like to pour his tea and sit and be always next to him like a chatterbox. It seemed to me I did nothing but chatter. And Baba used to enjoy these things. And I would say, oh Baba, you can't be what you are because you're always listening to this kind of stupid talk. And Baba said, well, I made stupid people too, didn't I? I said, and then, of course, that used to be. And Baba said, well, I'm not stupid, Baba. Said, no, of course not if I created you. <laughs> so then in Genoa, it was the moment where the people from, uh, um, uh, we were going to Portofino. They had arranged that we were going to take this beautiful villa and live a month together. And there we used to be living with Baba. We went swimming. And probably there'll be others who'll tell you more about the serious side. I can't tell you much about the seriousness. And probably I can tell you more about the incredible joyful event of feeling what it was like to be a human being who never condemned you, that you felt free with him, that what you did was not of great importance, and yet it was important, that all that you said, I can't explain to you in words because the sentiment and the feeling was something so joyful. And I don't want to, I want to give you a picture of Baba in this way of being with us, treating us and at the same time teaching us, because sometimes there'd be such experiences. Um, for instance, I wanted to make, um, I could make breakfast. I said, Baba, I can make breakfast for all the people. And he said to me, you want to make breakfast? I said, yes, I love to make breakfast because I can get up early and then I can. But you can't imagine the difficulty that had occurred because making breakfast, I thought, was something always very easy. But when you have many people together and each person thinks they want their way of doing things, it becomes a terrible confusion. I'll never forget the order that was given to me the first day. Black coffee, uh, black and white coffee, light coffee, light toast, dark toast, soft boiled egg, one minute, two minutes soft boiled egg. Um, no, somebody didn't want starch. They wanted fruit. Somebody wanted cornflakes. It it was a list as long as I've never seen anything. So the first morning, I spent all day long trying to make this breakfast. But nothing seemed to occur because it was so difficult to do it all. The next day, Baba came and I looked and I was trying to make all this. And I said to Baba, Baba, what in the world do these people all want? They all want something different. He said, what are you doing there? I said, I'm trying to make breakfast. And what is this breakfast? I said, well, some want tea, some want coffee, some want this, some want that, some want toast black, and some want white, some want no starch. He said, but this is nonsense. So he called them all in and said, from now on, Anita is not going to make breakfast. We'll all have to take what's put on the table to the joy and the relief. I was allowed to go swimming. We, and I was allowed to go swimming. Some of the other people didn't swim. They stayed there because they had a lot of work to do with Baba. But we, the younger ones, were, were given great freedom. We were allowed to go to swim, to come back, and then Baba told us what to do. Eat, and then we would sit and Baba would discuss uh, questions, which were usually spiritual questions. But what was in beautiful at those moments, it wasn't so much what was being said, but what was being felt. There used to be such wonderful moments where we all would sit together in the mist and we were like this beautiful, like a wonderful family around Baba. There was 
We would, and then we would try to amuse Baba, we try to make right stories, we would try to uh, make um, uh, plays. We were very much involved at those days to do this. Uh, Margaret Crask was uh, with Quinton Todd and Mabel. They were, they knew a great deal about dancing, so they were allowed, we were allowed to write and we were going to make a beautiful festival for Baba. And at moments Baba was very, very beautiful. I can only say that he would sit there in this incredible way and you felt such very difficult to put into words. Sometimes it's very difficult to describe things into words when you're feeling uh, very deeply what's happening. All I can say, it was seemed to be so natural. Everything was natural. Nothing was forced. All the people, all those that had little freaks in them, with all twisted, was taken out. Everything was quiet, with it seems naturally that others, Baba was working through others, but I can only speak of my personal um, attitude, which was, as I say, a natural joy. And the others all had different experiences with him. Some were being trained, some were being I always felt as if um, we were different types that Barbara was working through. And yet, on the other hand, I never wanted to go uh, into anything that seemed unnatural. And I remember one day seated on the steps with Barbara, and Barbara said to me, Anita, do you know who I am? And I looked at him and I said, no, Barbara. And he said, do you know who I am? I said, no, Barbara, I don't know who you are. He said, do you know that I'm both man and God? I said, Barbara, darling. I can't understand you as a man. How do you expect me to understand you as God? And he laughed. He says, that's right. I said, but after all, you know, it doesn't matter if you made a mistake. I love you so much that it doesn't matter at all. I'm perfectly willing to accept it as a little whim of yours. And Baba was in a perfect joy. He called all the Indian disciples and said, you know what Anita said? It doesn't matter if she made a mistake because she'll love me anyway. Which caused a lots of... All the Indians were laughing, because they were all with the Indian group we were. And then, uh, let me see, there's so much to say, I don't want to speak so much. From there on, then we had to go to London. There was a, a yes, I wanted to recall that famous, there's an accident that happened at Portofino, and I happened to be with Baba. It was the day we were walking along the, a kind of a cliff, and Baba said, and I always used to run after him, always, always running after him. And Baba had the little Indian boy, who probably is a grown-up man now, by the hand, and I was tottering along. And Baba said, you really want to come? I said, yes, Baba, I want to come along with you. And we came along this cliff, when all of a sudden, the little boy jumped over, and Baba jumped over a kind of a, uh, it was a narrow, um, uh, what I say, it was a kind of a, and these rocks, suddenly the rocks began to give away. Baba already was on the other side, and I sat, and I looked down, and I saw all the sea. I would be very high up, and it was extremely dangerous, and I knew that I had to sit under that little rock and not move. Time, we heard Baba clap. We didn't know what this clapping meant. Because I can't tell you what was happening. I can only tell you from this place I was seated um, what was happening. Because Kitty's brother and Aria, they were taken and they were holding on to the roots of a tree and had it given away. They would have fallen down on the cliff and hit me and we all had fallen into the sea. When we get there, and it was a very strange moment, and I said, I looked and I said, well, I'm not going to, if I'm going to die here, I'm not going to die in a stupid way, I'm at least going to be quiet and die quietly. If Bobby is what he is, he'll take me out of this. If he isn't what he is, I said, well, I shall be, I shall be brave. Without, um, how can I put it, at the same time, seated very quietly under that huge stone, looking at the sea and noticing the beauty of the place, when suddenly 
I don't know how long it was. It seemed to me it was very long, and yet it wasn't very long. Dear Pendle came down. He was tied in a rope, and he scraped away things, and he put, they pulled me up. And, the, and then I, when I was crossing to see, there was Baba, all in white, and all his clothes was very, very, because of the heat, was very, he looked like an incredible Byzantine figure, and his head was bandaged, and he was clapping and making strange noise as if it came out of his throat. And it was all I could see. I had no fear. I was just taken by this beautiful vision that something incredible was happening, and yet I couldn't, I can't tell you because I was being pulled up. And then I, we all, Baba came and embraced us and said he had done some work which we were totally unconscious of. And that night, for the first time, he gave us a little wine to drink because none of us drank anything. Those were strict days, vegetarian days, with no freedom at all, what you would call freedom now, that Baba afterwards gave to everyone. We had to go to bed early. We were living a very secluded life, a very, um, um, well, a disciplined life, let's say. A disciplined life. But that vision of Baba I shall always carry as something that remained, which I will not be able to put in exact words, because this, it was so, and you would never see things like that. It was beyond any experience that anyone can ever have. But, as I say, I experienced nat a natural, a little fear, at the same time, a great security. Because there's always this duality in us. One tells us one thing, and we don't want to listen to what is the other because we think the other is the unnatural. But, of course, what we should realize that the unnatural is the insecurity and the natural is the security. So then we came back and our life continued. And um, on the 10th of July, I remember we had to, um, as Baba's date was, we all um, did um, uh, fasting and then we were given food and then we we're allowed to do different things. But in all this, Discipline, you never felt it as discipline. You felt it as a kind of a natural way of living uh, under um, a being that you loved. Because you loved Baba. Those that you were there loved Baba. We can't explain why this, how this love was, but we loved him and how he was towards us. He had such patience, tremendous patience. He looked after everything that we needed, everything that we wanted, everything that was that was meant for her. It was a mixture of discipline, of music, of gaiety, of those that were going through um, sometimes scenes, incredible scenes, some who were going, doing this. But as I say, in the end, now that we look back, it was the most like heaven on earth. Nothing we ever do, nothing we ever experience since can attain that perfection of living. Then, I didn't see Baba again, but what's important is that I tell you what I felt about Baba, is with time, everything I do, I see this kind of secret way the silence of Baba has become, Baba has become a necessity for me now, and the voice of Baba is something that speaks to me inwardly. It's life itself. This is extraordinary life that he's given you because you become more sensitive. You begin to see the play within the play. He always would say, play your game well. I didn't realize what it meant, playing that game well. But I know what it, what it means now to see that some 
this freedom that most people think is freedom because they do what they like seems to me a kind of a comedy. They're being used. They're puppets. Because real freedom is not that. It's only when you've been with Baba and you know the respect, what you have to have, the tolerance, the understanding, the love. You're unconcerned. And then you realize that your body was given to you because it's really a temple of God. And in this temple, if Baba lives in this temple, you want this temple to be a pure. You want this temple, which is you and Baba, to be something that he can walk in and out, that he can breathe, that he can live, that nothing of the cupidity or the greed or the horror or the, or the little meannesses that we are made of. We can't. And Baba can only live in this pure temple that we are. And little by little, we begin, instead of wanting to clean the outside things, we begin to clean inwardly. It's an inner, tremendous inner work that you begin to do. And in cleaning yourself, you help you clean others. In doing things to yourself, you really help others. In knowing yourself, you begin to know others. You're all linked together. And through Baba's love, because never you, you never can understand what this love is, because no one has ever loved you that way. No one has, can ever touch you that way. No one can ever speak to you that way. It's very difficult to know the sun or to read about the sun. You have to experience the sun. And to me, it's always getting closer to the sun. Because I must tell you that Baba was extremely humorous. I remember one day coming into the room and he hid himself in the back of a, a, a door and I came in singing tra la 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 and suddenly Baba comes out and I had give a tremendous yell. I said, really, Baba, you frighten me to death. He said, how can God frighten you? I said, but why do you always say the word God? Really, as if, I don't know, you, 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 you upset me by these things. Well, Baba said, well, um, do you love me? I said, of course I love you, that's enough. Well, that's good, don't worry anymore then. Just go on, be as you are. Cheerful, plain work, and don't... He said, you won't read the things anyway that I'm going to ask you to read. You won't read them, so just be as you are. Then, um, what was very amusing one day, when, was when Baba um, gave, um, we, were, we were playing, for, we made a play for Baba. And Delia and I were, Dana, we were they gave us costumes and we were Dalmatian hounds. And I thought we were being very beautiful dogs, Delia and I. Uh, uh, Margaret Krask has written this play. And then when I came out, I said, Baba, did you see me? Baba said, see you. Where were you? He said, where were you? I said, I was one of the Dalmatian hounds. Baba said, you? And <laughs> Baba hadn't even recognized us, Delia, because, you see, our heads were down. And we were trying to be this, these dogs running around because it was a hunting scene that Quinton Todd had, um, had made. But I wanted to tell you how I was always very childlike with Baba. It was very natural for me. I always wanted to make that Baba should have fun. I didn't want to ever tire him. Uh, I felt sometimes when all these people came with all their problems, it was such a terrible weight. It was so heavy that when they left, I always felt my role was to make him laugh, to make, to be playful, to take away all that heaviness that was occurring. So it was very joyful for to him. And he used to always say, where is Anita? Make her come in so I can have some fun. And I'd come in and naturally I would think of words, I would think of, I would imitate some of the people around us. And I remember one day in a, in a, in a very serious thing that happened in, in, uh, in uh, south of France, Baba sent, uh, sent us to 
on an errand when we came in and I was very upset because Norina, we, Dina and I were wearing shorts nowadays. All that is nothing. But you must remember this was in 1937. Uh, people around spiritual masters didn't go around with shorts or look the way they do. Uh, everybody's trying to look like a, a, a past Christ these days. But then if you look like something like that, you were a little bit suspicious of what that person was. And it was terribly funny because Barbara was receiving someone with a tremendous beard. And I, Nadina said to me, now be careful when you pass the salon.